It is recording. So now anything that you say will now go into the cloud and be saved onto our Zoom profile page. So, okay. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Um, that seems to make sense since we are gonna be talking about prayer. Um, but we're gonna pray and we're gonna jump in to what we're doing today. I'll give a little introduction and then we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time. Uh, even this, as wonderful it is to, to see people's faces and talk, it's still not the same. And so we ask that you would restore us to being able to do these things face-to-face uh, -face and not through screens. But until that day, uh, we pray that you'd bless these times, that you'd bless this evening as we get into your word and seek to grow together in an area that many of us feel inadequate. Would you equip us by your spirit to hear from you and would you so speak and so move as your word is opened up uh, that you would help us to grow in a Christ image by the power of your spirit. For we pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, as you uh, know, I'm, we're going to be going through the prayers of Paul. Um, the first thing I just want to note is the next several weeks, I have seven weeks beyond this week planned, so eight weeks total. It could go longer than that. We could shorten that. Uh, just kind of depends on what's going to happen uh, over the next month or so. And so, again, we look forward to when we can be face-to-face, -face. and if that happens, then we will go uh, perhaps make a new plan, or perhaps we'll keep going with what we're doing. We'll, we'll see. Um, and so I want to be flexible with what this ends up looking like, not knowing what kind of hiccups there will be. Um, but for now, the plan is to go through seven of Paul's prayers um, in the weeks ahead. But for tonight, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce why we are talking about prayer, why it's so urgent that we talk about prayer, and then also to talk about three things that shape Paul's prayers and therefore should shape our prayers as well. Um, I will ask this first. We have some people coming in. Um, I'm going to just unmute. Oops. Everybody. Je do we, Jim, Jamie, Jeff, Kim, do we hear you? Are you guys hearing all this? Yeah. Yes. Got a yes from one. So that was, uh, we, have, we have four people tuning in that I, I don't see your faces, so I don't know who said yes. I'm assuming that everybody can hear. Yeah, I can, I can hear you. I don't have a webcam on my, on my desktop, though. It's in my laptop, which is buried away. Gotcha. Thanks, Jamie. Kim uh, DeRyder can hear you. Okay, very good, Kim. Uh, Jeff and Jim, can you hear? I think Jim um, walked outside. Okay. Is this is this uh, Jim? Uh, do our is it Jim Wanzer or a different Jim? Without or is this your is this your Jim that doesn't have the video on there? I think so. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get going, and um, and hopefully everybody can hear okay. I am muting you all again. You are muted. Okay. So today, then, let's begin by just looking at the issue at hand, the urgent need to pray. Um, and some of this um, I will be sharing with you today and in the weeks ahead. Not all of it, um, just chunks of it will come from this book. Uh, it's a book by D.A. Carson called Praying with Paul. Um, the subtitle is A Call to Spiritual Reformation. The first edition was called, the subtitle was Priorities from Paul and His Prayers. And what he does, what Carson does in that book, is he goes through Paul's prayers in the New Testament, and he has other chapters scattered about other aspects of prayer as well. But he just walks through them to look at how should we pray uh, as Paul prays. And so we're going to be doing a very similar thing. And so I'm going to be using some of what he does. We'll be using some other uh, material as well. And every week, I have about six books or so on prayer that I that are just very highly commended. And so every week, I'm going to share a new one. And this will be the one for today. Um, so by all means, if you want a book on prayer, this one will bless you to no end. It will convict you, as it probably uh, will bring some conviction tonight. I will tell you, I have been very convicted, but also very encouraged um, by this book and others on prayer. And so this is a great one, and we'll be sharing some more in the weeks ahead. 
So the first question, and this actually comes from Carson's book that I want to ask, and this is, this is not a question that we'll respond to. It's just a question that I want you to start thinking about. And the question is this, what is the most pressing need in the contemporary church of the Western world? What is the most pressing need? Uh, this is the question that Carson raises at the beginning of the book to just get into, uh, get into talking about Paul's prayer. And as he does that, he raises a lot of different ways that this question could be answered. Uh, and, and a lot of these things you'll see are good things, good, good ways that we could potentially answer these that don't quite live up to the way we should answer them. And so the first thing that he says is that we could say sexual purity. Uh, the world, this, the Western world is in sexual chaos. Uh, he actually wrote this, by the way, in the early 90s. So this is before the homosexual revolution. This is before it was legalized. Uh, he, I don't even know if he would have saw that coming down the pike, um, but this is something that he was even seeing then, that sexual purity is one way that somebody could answer this question, the greatest need of the church. Um, so that's one way you could answer it. Another way you could answer is saying that we need to deal with uh, the biggest justice issues of the day. The biggest needs of the church are to deal with things like abortion. Uh, and in many ways, abortion is like the slavery of our day. It is that big of an issue. So some people say we need to really deal with the abortion issue, and the church needs to get on, on the ball in terms of getting legislation passed, which leads to another one as well that you could say we need Christians to be more involved in political activism, uh, or we need Christians to be more involved just in uh, at a governmental level. We need more Christians in government. Some say that's the most pressing need of the day. Um, and of course, again, very good thing uh, to have Christians involved in the political sphere. We should want that, just like we should want all these things. But is it the most pressing need of the church? Another way that somebody could answer it is we need more financial integrity, more generosity, um, we do have lots of issues of greed in the Western world. You see this, of course, with pastors who uh, just fall off the map because they've given themselves to getting private jets, all sorts of other things. And so what we need, some say, is we need to learn to be generous. We need to get our financial lives in order. Uh, or you get more spiritual, Carson says. Uh, you could say that the greatest need of the church right now is to have more church planting more evangelism. Uh, we need people to give the gospel more. That's what we need more than anything in the Western church. Um, and so that's another thing that somebody might say. Uh, again, all these things, we need them, great things, but are they the most pressing thing? And then the last thing that we could say, um, that the most pressing need of the church is that we need to know the Bible better. Uh, this is a rough one for me to say that it's not the most urgent need of the church. I've given myself to knowing the Bible and teaching the Bible. Uh, is knowing the Bible the most pressing need for the church? Well, it's definitely an essential one. But what Carson goes on to say is that all of these things, as good as they are, as much as we should pursue them, they are not the most essential thing. The most pressing need of the church today, the most pressing need of the church in any day, is a deeper knowledge of God. It's a deeper knowledge of God. And you see this when you realize that all of these things, as good as they are, can actually be pursued apart from knowing God. You can grow in sexual purity and promote sexual purity without really knowing God. I mean, if you go into the Middle East, for example, you're going to see a concern for sexual purity and the fact that they're going to cover their whole bodies uh, in clothing so that you don't see anything except for their faces, except for women's faces. So you can pursue sexual purity apart from a true knowledge of God. You could also defend abortion without knowing God. You could also handle money well or promote a Christian agenda in politics without knowing God. You can even, God help us, you can even engage in church planting and evangelism and knowing the Bible and preaching the word without knowing God. And what we must have more than anything is a deep and abiding knowledge of the living God that flows out into all these things. It must be the root and the foundation of all these wonderful things that we should be pursuing, that we should be doing. But if we don't have knowledge of God at the core, what we will end up being like is Pharisees. Uh, you think, for example, the fact that the Pharisees in the New Testament knew more scripture and memorized more scripture than probably any of us will ever memorize. 
but they didn't know God. You can have scripture memorized without knowing God. And so what we need more than anything is a deeper knowledge of God. Carson goes on to say this uh, in this opening chapter of his book. He says, if we seek these things without passionately desiring a deeper knowledge of God, we are selfishly running after God's blessings without running after him. We are even worse than the man who wants his wife's services, someone to come home to, someone to cook and clean, someone to sleep with without ever making the effort to really know and love his wife and discover what she wants and needs. We can do that with God, where we seek the things that he can give us, the blessings that he gives us, without seeking him and a desire to know him. But the most important question for us always is at the heart, do we want God? Do we want to know God? Are we pursuing him at the core of our being? And when you read passages in the New Testament, they don't just back this up, they throw you into this with, uh, with a ton of gravity. One of the most important verses in John's gospel is John 17, 3, where, John sa or where Jesus says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Uh, there are a lot of important verses in John, obviously. Uh, John 3.16, for example, uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. An incredibly important text. But just consider, if we don't know what eternal life is, we miss a huge part of that verse. That eternal life is this, knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. That the whole purpose of God sending Christ into the world, of the Father sending the Son, is to give himself as our redemption and to bring us into a deep and abiding forever knowledge of God that only continues to grow. Uh, we know this also, of course, in the first question of the Shorter Catechism, don't we? What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And you can't glorify God unless you are enjoying him. Uh, you can't pursue God and seeking to please him unless you care about him. And this knowledge of God is, of course, not just knowing about God. You can know facts about God in the same way you can know facts about your spouse without knowing them. And so we can know things about God without truly knowing God. At the heart of this, it is a relational aspect, not treating God as a genie who gives us what we want, but knowing him as a true and living God who loves us, who cares for us, who wants us to know him. And this is what ultimately gives us the reason why we need to pursue prayer. Because at the heart of what prayer is, at the heart of what it means to come before God in prayer, it is to come before him as our father, to come before him in desperation. Uh, that prayer, especially private closet prayer, shows more about what we know of God, how much we truly know him as our father than anything else that we do. Uh, public prayer, for example, you can fake, just like the Pharisees could lift up their hands and pray before people and want people to see them. You could fake that. But it is really hard to fake prayer when you're by yourself before God. It's just you and him. And you're either coming before him in desperation and looking to know him more and commune with him, or you're empty. Um, and so what we do in prayer says more about our relationship with God than almost anything that we do, probably anything that we do. That's how important it is that we pray. Uh, so how we pray reveals how we think about ourselves and God, and what we pray also reveals what we care about most. Uh, so prayer reveals something about our relationship with God um, in terms of what we pray and in terms of how we pray. How well do we know our Father? How much are we seeking his face and communion with him? Are we coming before him in desperation and emptiness? Or are we coming before him and just asking him to give us stuff? Are we asking him to help us grow in him? See, prayer says so much about what we know about God and how much we truly know him relationally. Uh, one of the most convicting quotes I have ever heard on this, um, and when I first heard it, 
uh, it, it was very, uh, it just hit me smack in between the eyes. It was by Robert Murray McShane. He said, what a man is alone on his knees before God, that he is and no more. What a man is on his knees alone before God, that he is and nothing more. Um, another one is from J.I. Packer. He says, I believe that prayer is the measure of the man spiritually in a way that nothing else is, so that how we pray is as important a question as we can ever face. A prayer can, reveals our hearts, which is why when you think about prayer, uh, it's one of the most com convicting, uh, convicting things you can do. When you self-assess and look at your own prayer life, it can be utterly debilitating. Um, and so it's worth saying just from the beginning, I'm not coming at this as a professional, uh, looking to help all of you guys grow in your prayer lives while I have it down. I'm actually looking to come before the word with you because I feel as inadequate in prayer and communion with God as anybody. And I want to grow in humbling myself before scripture uh, and knowing how God shows us um, how we ought to, to pursue him in prayer and what it means to commune with him. Uh, there's a quote by Carson, I think that I have it here for you as well, that gets at this urgent need to pray. And he says this, where is our delight in praying? Where is our sense that we are meeting with the living God, that we are doing business with God, that we are in interceding with a genuine unction before the throne of grace? He said, I don't write these things to manipulate you or to be engendering guilty feelings. But what shall we do? Have not many of us tried at one point or another to improve our praying and floundered so badly that we are more discouraged than we ever were? Can we profitably meet the other challenges that confront the Western church if prayer is ignored as much as it has been? Um, and so this is my conviction in this as well, is that prayer is at the heart of everything that we're going to do in the church. And if our prayer lives are floundering, then we will not be able to grow in all these different areas. And so as an amateur who wants to humble myself before the word, uh, I invite us to go in to see what God would have for us um, by looking at a few more things over the next several weeks so that we would grow in communing with God, in knowing God, and in knowing how and what we ought to pray in communion with God in this way. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to raise a question to you. Um, I've, I've laid it out there for me. This is something that I want to grow in. It is something that uh, I want to teach on because I want to grow in it. How do you guys feel about this? When you think about prayer, do you feel a sense of inadequacy? Do you feel as though you struggle to pray? How do you feel when you hear quotes like, what a man is on his knees before God, that he is and nothing more? How do you guys feel about that? And I'm going to unmute you all, and whoever wants to speak, just raise your hand. Yes. Okay. I sometimes look in my prayer life as I look at when I'm talking to God and when I'm done sometimes, it's mostly about my needs. Yes. Uh, I, after I'm through with prayer, I'm wondering, you know, that was all about me. Yeah. And I have to work on that. And, yeah. Uh, so. Absolutely. Uh, I'm right there with you, and, and that's, you know, it is appropriate for us to pray for ourselves and our needs, um, and it's good to, to even begin there after, we'll talk a little bit about this in the weeks ahead, um, as we begin with our focus upon God to then pray and ask God um, to help us uh, in a lot of different ways, and so it's okay to focus on our needs and ask God for help, but of course we need to move beyond that as well, so it's wonderful that you're recognizing that. Does anybody else have any other thoughts? I'll say that yes. in, in the past year, I have been praying, just genuinely asking God to use me and to help me see how he wants to use me, not how I want to be used. Um, and he definitely answers that prayer in big ways. Yeah. Um, but sometimes it's hard. Like, how do you, you have so many thoughts and words to really put it in a way that feels legitimate to bring before God. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. It's encouraging to hear that you've grown and, and that's wonderful. And, you know, the encouraging thing about seeking God in prayer, another book that I'm going to share at some point um, in the next several weeks is by a Puritan who talks about how prayer is nothing but crying out uh, to God. And so if you feel yourself struggling with prayer, the first thing that you can do is say, God, help me. Teach me to pray. Do what the disciples did. Um, and, and when you do that, you actually find yourself praying uh, because that's what prayer is, is going to God, uh, begging him. So any, any other thoughts? Very good. Well, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, I want, you know, sometimes they say in Bible study settings, you should uh, obey the 30-second rule, that if nobody answers uh, after the first few seconds, just give it 30 seconds of silence. Eventually, somebody will say something. So I won't quite go that far, but uh, I will allow a little bit, and now we'll move on. So um, this gets us into, and I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone again. Um, this gets us into uh, three things that I want us to see that shape Paul's prayers. And so today is going to be a little different than what we're going to do in, next, in the next several weeks. The next several weeks, we're going to be going through specific prayers of Paul and spend the whole time in individual texts. Uh, today, what I want to do is go through what shapes Paul's prayers. Um, we could surely probably talk about more than just these three things I'm going to mention today, but I think these are three of the big ones. Um, and these are things that are forming in Paul a framework that approach, uh, that affect how he approaches God and what he prays for. And the first thing to see um, is that Paul is shaped in his prayer by who God is and what he has done for us. Um, if you go through, and I have a number of texts that we're going to go through as, uh, throughout the process. If you go through Paul's prayers, you'll find in the first place that he is shaped by God as Trinity. Um, that Paul is praying to the Father through the Son in the power of the Spirit. He's praying to the Father through the Son in the power of the Spirit. There's a lot more that can be said about the Trinity. Um, I love the doctrine of the Trinity and would love at some point to teach on that as well. We can't do everything. Um, but just to, to get us into how Paul is approaching God, it's important to at least see that he's approaching God as Trinity. Uh, Ephesians 3 specifically shows this, and this is a prayer that we're going to get at in later weeks. But Paul prays, and you can see the mention of the Trinity throughout this prayer. And this is just one of many. But he says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And then he goes on to pray that they would know Christ's love, being rooted and grounded in his love, um, and to, to know the love that surpasses even knowledge. And again, we'll get into all of that uh, when we look at that specific prayer in future weeks. But here it's just important to note how Paul is approaching God. He's approaching God as the Father, asking that he would reveal more of Christ's love by the Spirit strengthening us in our inner being. Um, and so he's asking, his focus in prayer is always directed to the Father, that the Father would strengthen him in here, in the, in the core of our being, by the Spirit, to see more of Christ. Um, and in many ways, this is where the Christian life begins, that we've been adopted by our loving Father, and we are now his children through Christ. We've been adopted as children of God through the Son of God, and now we are seeking Christ to be more like him. And the way in which you grow in being like Christ is by knowing Christ more. And so we pray to the Father to reveal more of his Son, but we need the Spirit to strengthen us inside to see more of the Son. And so you find Paul all throughout his prayers directing himself to the Father by, uh, through Christ by the power of the Spirit. Now, I'll just say this doesn't mean that we never pray to the Son only. It uh, doesn't mean that we never pray to the Spirit. Uh, but it means that at the heart of prayer is a Trinitarian God-centeredness that flows through everything um, that Paul does in his prayer life. And so that's one thing to see, 
that Paul's prayers are shaped by God as Trinity. Another thing, Paul's prayers are also shaped by God's character and attributes. Um, I have a few texts to go through here that get at this. Um, but when Paul is praying, he often begins by saying something about the God that he's praying to, and then he prays for the very thing that is a characteristic of God. For example, he prays for power, so that believers would have power in Colossians 1.11. He prays that they would be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. He prays that their power would come from God because God is the one who's powerful. He's praying to the powerful God to give power. Uh, another example is in Romans 15, 13, where he prays for hope. But look at the way that he does it. He doesn't just say, Lord, give them hope. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. He's praying to the God of hope to give the hope that only he can give by giving uh, the joy and peace of the Spirit. Uh, Paul's prayers also tie God's character to what he has done for us in Christ. We see this in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. Paul prays that they would know their glorious inheritance. Um, but look at how he says it. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. There's another prayer that we're going to get into later, because there's a lot there. Um, but just in brief, look at what he's doing. He's praying that the Father of glory would reveal more of who he is and help us to know the glorious inheritance that he has granted for us in Christ. The God who possesses all glory gives us a glorious inheritance. And so he's praying to God that the God of glory would give that, reveal that, to help us to see more of that. Uh, another way that this happens is in 2 Thessalonians 2, where Paul, Paul prays that the Thessalonians would have eternal comfort. He says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. He prays to the God of comfort who gives eternal comfort so that we would receive comfort. Um, and so just think about that. So we talked about a few things uh, here that we're, our prayers ought to be shaped by who God is as Trinity, that our prayers ought to be shaped by God's character, by his attributes, that our prayers also tie God's character to what he has done for us in Christ so that we are asking, requesting things that come from the God who gives those things. So just think real quick, what are the implications of this? Again, I'm going to unmute you all. What are the implications that we are going to God in his character, in his attributes, and who he is as Trinity, and making our petitions in light of that? What are the, what are the implications there? Tanya. It implies that we know God's character. That we know God's character. Yes, you have to know God's character, right? So if you don't know God's character, uh, your prayer is going to, as we read earlier, is going to flounder. It's going to falter. Um, yeah, wonderful. What else? Yes, Richard. Well, um, I see that as we understand God's sovereignty over all things. He's sovereign over his universe, over uh suffering he's uh, over his uh, salvation that he offers to us it's all encompassing and so as we understand then we can have peace knowing that um, he is in control yeah. as we prayers and petitions to him uh, we leave them at the cross we don't have to worry yeah that, uh, we have to conjole him because he is already in our corner. Yeah, that's great. I mean, when you know God's character, as Tanya mentioned, know that he's powerful and sovereign over everything, as Richard mentioned. When you're focusing on God in that way, 
that affects your prayers and then gives you peace because the God that you're praying to, I mean, this is one of the reasons why Paul in, in Philippians 4 says, make all your peace make known to God and the peace that surpasses all understanding will fulfill your heart. Fulfill your heart. Um, because the peace that comes to us through prayer is because our focus is on the God who gives that peace and comfort. Um, anything else? What are other implications of this? You know, some of the things uh, have to do... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Carl. Well, I was just going to say there's a lot of power there if we're praying for God's character and attributes to be kind of given to us. we got to be prepared to receive and use it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fill that out a little more. Like, what are you thinking about specifically? Um... Well, like, let's see, the God of hope, well, the, the, the first one on this page, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. I mean, no one's more powerful than God. Yeah. If we're all of a sudden powerful, that can be a little dangerous if we're not using it for the right purposes, you know? Yeah. We would be giving it to us if we aren't anyway. Um, I don't know. Yeah, you know, and it's really interesting too. In that, um, uh, in Ephesians one, Paul, when he prays that God would strengthen with all power according to His glorious might, and for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, um, you know, he he. Um, or wait, is that Ephesians or is that Colossians that we're talking about? Colossians. Colossians. You know, yes, I'm thinking of Ephesians, which is very similar. You know, the one um, uh, in, a, in Ephesians talks about the same, same type of thing that it goes on to say the same power that's been given to us. It talks about it as resurrection power. Um, there's that song. I, don't, I think you guys have done it in the past. Resurrection power. Um, God's given us resurrection power living inside of us. Have you guys seen that one before? Maybe. There's a collective song I can think of that is called that, but I don't know if we've ever sung that one. Yeah. Well, the point is, it goes on in Ephesians 2 to say, you know, we were dead in our transgressions and sins, but we've been made alive together with Christ. Uh, and that's the resurrection power that has made us alive, even though we are dead. And when we pray that God's power would be given to us, we're praying that that same resurrection power would help us to live in newness of life, um, which fills Ephesians 2. And it is one of those things that you're right, like you pray for that, but it also means that there are aspects of living in light of that that we're called to, that we are his new creation and called to live in and through his power that he grants to us, which is a wonderful thing, but it does also come uh, with a particular calling. Yes, Emily. Um what Carl was saying made me think of what Jenny said at the beginning too, that, you know, when you're, when you're praying and asking God to, um, like Jenny said, you know, reveal things in, um, my life, you know, how ways that you want to use me, not necessarily ways that I'm thinking I should be used. And then going along with what Carl said, you know, when you're, when you're praying scripture and you're asking for, you know, these attributes of God to be manifested in our own lives, um, the, just those two kind of connected as, um, in my mind, as he was talking, you know, if you're, you're asking God to use you in certain ways or, or, you know, like I said, manifest these things in you to, to then, yeah, be be prepared for what God's going to do in your life when you're asking for, you know, and you're praying for these big things. Yeah. Um, so th those two just kind of connected when in my mind, when Carl was mentioning that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, prayer can be a scary thing if you're not, if you're not ready to humble yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, a, a different song by a group called indelible grace. That's I asked the Lord that I would know, um, uh, that I would grow in grace and knowledge. And so it's a, it's a prayer uh, that God would help me to grow 
And as the song goes on, it ends up talking about how, uh, how he helped me to see all of the filth inside of me. And that was the answer to prayer, revealing of sin, uh, taking away things that we are dependent upon. That you ask the Lord to grow, and, and that could be a painful process, but it's a very good process. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? I was just, uh, my mind kind of went to Psalm 37, 4, where it says, take delight in the Lord, and, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And like by, by seeking to pray the attributes of God back to him, we're like changing our own hearts into desiring those things that he wants for us. Yeah. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, there is, you know, an utter God-centeredness about all this, isn't there? Uh, that when your prayer begins with God, you know, you get your focus upon him, uh, all that he is for us. Uh, he does give us the desires of our hearts as they're reshaped into all that he wants for us uh, and begin growing in him. There's a reorientation that takes place when you pray this way. When you begin with who God is um, and what he is for us. Yeah, those are all great. You know, a couple other things that I just put down um, that are implications of this, that prayer is um, relational, that we're not just praying to God to zap energy into our lives. We're praying for God to give himself to us. Uh, we're praying for God to give us the peace that he possesses in himself and he gives to us in fatherly kindness. I mean, we're praying to the Father who gives us the spirit, who isn't just an energy force, but is the very personal essence of God coming to us to dwell with us and give all that God is for us as father and son. The spirit gives us the father and the son. Um, and so it's very relational. Prayer has to do with communion with God as we come before him. Uh, it's very personal. Um, and so it also, as it was mentioned, we need to know God's character. As, as Tanya mentioned, it's tied to our knowledge of God's word as well. As much as we said before that, uh, you know, you can know the Bible without knowing God. You can also uh, pray without, uh, without knowing God because you don't know the Bible. And so our prayer needs to be informed by our knowledge of Scripture. And those two things have to go together. Uh, that what we find in Paul more than anything is he doesn't just have a knowledge of Bible facts, um, but his knowledge of the Bible serves this deep and abiding and growing relationship with God where he knows him more and more, not just stuff about God but he knows God so that our Bible reading and prayer ought to go hand in hand, uh, helping us to know who God is and then bringing us into knowing him more as father, son, and spirit. And so that's the first way to see that Paul is shaped is that Paul in the, is uh, shaped in his prayer by who God is and what he has done for us. Um, the second way to see that Paul is shaped in prayer and affects his approach in prayer is that he is thankful. What he is thankful for in particular is for God's grace in others. Um, this is really interesting to think about thankfulness. Um, D.A. Carson in his book mentions that what Paul is thankful for often shapes his prayers. Um, both his prayers of thankfulness when he thanks God, but also his requests um, and it's not hard to understand why. I mean, what we are thankful for often reveals quite a bit about what most concerns us. Uh, and so both your requests and what you pray and, ask and, and uh, thank God for are going to flow from your central concerns. Um, so just think about this for a little bit. Um, we all love a good meal. And so when we sit down and we have a wonderful feast before us, whether it's Thanksgiving or another time, it's very common to thank the Lord for this food. That's more than appropriate. Um, you know, we pray also for good health. Again, these are appropriate prayer requests, praying for good health. Uh, we pray for safety. Um, we pray for getting all the family together. And we're, it's because we're, these are things that we're thankful for when they happen, right? We are thankful for safety. And when we travel somewhere after praying for traveling mercies, we then thank the Lord that he kept us safe. And so what you are thankful for gives a deep insight into what concerns you most. And so when we see what Paul is thankful for, when he goes to God in prayer and he gives thanks, you see something very deep about what he's centrally concerned about. Um, and what he is centrally concerned about and, is, and what he's thankful for, more than almost anything else, uh, with the exception of God himself, is seeing the work of God in others. 
seeing God's grace at work in others. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone again. Um, and so just look at some of these texts along these lines. Um, in Colossians 1, verses 3 and 4, you should have all these on your sheet if you have that. Colossians 1, 3 and 4, Paul says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Um, so you see what he's thankful for there, and we'll come back around some of these in a second. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, and 3 is another one. Paul says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. And so this is just a snapshot of what Paul is thankful for. Um, but just asking you guys, I mean, what, what, is, what is he saying there? What is Paul thankful for? Yes, Carl. Faith and love. All three of them have faith and love. Boom, boom, boom. Faith and love. Exactly right. And so faith has to do with seeing their faith specifically in God. So that's the vertical, right? And love here, is it love for God specifically here, or is it love for others? Love for others, right? Um, which is really interesting. Um, but the, these things, I mean, Paul's thankful for other things too. We could pull out other texts, but this gets us at the heart of what is going on, um, what is going on in Paul's prayers, what he's centrally concerned about, that Paul loves seeing believers grow in their faith in Christ, and he loves seeing them love, what, love one another. He loves seeing them mature. Like, that's what Paul is centrally concerned about, seeing the church genuinely grow in Christ by trusting in him and their love for others. Uh, and especially, you know, there's a couple, two verses there were from Thessalonians. And it's interesting in Thessalonians, I mean, one of his reasons in uh, the church in Thessalonica for being so thankful for their faith is because they were growing in faith during a period of persecution. And so when Paul sees that they're still trusting in Christ while being persecuted, that leads him to great thankfulness to God. Because what he longs for in their lives is happening even through persecution. And the same thing is true also for seeing their love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and D.A. Carson has a quote along these lines as well. Uh, he says, when Christians do grow in their love for each other for no other reason than because they are loved by Jesus Christ and love him in return, that growing love is an infallible sign of grace in their lives. And so as Paul sees these churches growing in faith in Christ and loving one another, not gossiping and bickering, even through persecution, but instead they're growing in this unity and love for one another, it, he just overflows with thankfulness, and that shapes the way that he prays. It shapes what he's thankful for, and it also shows his central concerns so that when Paul goes on to make petitions, and ask God for things, they're almost always in line with wanting to see more faith grow in the church and more love grow in the church. Uh, and that's why we say that Paul's thankfulness shows his framework, his approach to prayer, um, and, and it shapes how he prays as well. And so let me just unmute you all again. And just to, to throw it out there for you, how do you, how do you guys think about this? What are you most thankful for, especially when you pray to God? Do you tend to thank him in the way that Paul does here? Or do we tend to do other things like thanking him for good things, but they tend to be more uh, related to externals, perhaps? You know, thank you that uh, we were able to have some free time and hang out as a family, which I pray for all the time. Um, you know, but how do we tend to be thankful in our prayers? Emily. I definitely tend towards, I can't remember who had said it initially, um, 
but in the beginning that I, I find myself uh, more, more often thanking him for things that have happened to me, maybe a, a prayer request answered or, which again, like you said, not a bad thing, but, um, uh, but my prayers can tend to be, uh, prayers of thankfulness can tend to be more inward focused than, you know, like what you're saying here with Paul, the greatest thing he's thankful for is seeing the work of Christ in others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So that's one thing to get is that Paul, I mean, there's no doubt there are times, I mean, he, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, Paul blesses the God of all comforts for giving him comfort. It's another one of those where he knows that God's the God of comfort and he blesses him for giving him comfort. Uh, in his affliction. And so he's thanking God for, for helping him, comforting him. So that's, it's more than appropriate to do that. But by and large, when you look at Paul's prayers, he's praying for people all the time. Um, he's utterly shaped um, by this other's orientation rather than a self-orientation. Uh, so that's one thing is, is definitely getting, what else, what else do we see um, or can we see think about in terms of reflecting on our own thankfulness or even just reflecting on how Paul is thankful here. Anybody else? We got 20 more seconds. <laughs> I mean, another, um, I know sometimes I'll start, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I'll start praying for me and then it's like, Oh wait, I got to pray for other people. So it's like, I catch myself after the fact. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I do the exact same thing, you know? And another thing to see here is a lot of times, you know, our thankfulness, again, this is totally not wrong. Um, and a lot of this is just reshaping our priorities in prayer. But our thankfulness a lot of times can be on external things. Like we're thankful for health, uh, which we should be. I mean, it's, it's good to be thankful for health. We're, yeah, go ahead, Jenny. Um, just as I read this, realizing that I tend to pray more for unbelievers than to pray for what God is doing in believers. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's another good one to see. Yeah, that we should be praying for unbelievers, absolutely. But we also are constantly in need in the church of growing too, and we should be praying for brothers and sisters in Christ, absolutely. Yeah, and there's, you know, the, the thing that really hits me is when I think about what I'm thankful for, I just so often tend to be thankful for comforts. You know, things that uh, having the comfort of my home, having the comfort of financial provision, um, a number of other things that have to do with externals rather than having a deep and abiding thankfulness for the work of God's grace uh, all around me. And so that's one of the things that I always want to grow in is, uh, number one, assessing my thankfulness. What am I most thankful for? Um, but then number two, genuinely moving that into prayer for others, that God would uh, grow us in faith in Christ and in love for one another. Um, and so, yeah, so those are all, all great. And this leads to a third thing. Does anybody else have anything else on that before we move on? John, yeah. I was just going to say, working with youth, and I'm guessing the parents can relate to this, like just seeing the progress they make, there's always a lot to be thankful for, for that. So yes. Yeah. It becomes really natural to think of other people when you're being thankful there. So the, the thing that sometimes I forget to do is you pray a lot on the front end that, you know, this Bible study or Sunday school or whatever, that God would work through it. And then when he does, sometimes you forget to go back and thank him for it. You know, yeah. so that's, that's one of the things that I forget to do sometimes, but like when you're, yeah. when you are, you know, doing your best to, you know, teach people and, and help them grow and learn about God, like that is something that leads to thankfulness being about other people. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's, um, I do that too, you know, when having, um, uh, oh, go ahead, Tanya. Well, you could have finished your thought, but I was going to add that a, a acronym I heard a long time ago that stuck with me is to pray through the acronym JOY, Jesus First or 
the Trinity, others, and then yourself. Yeah. And I think what Jenny shared about always thinking of others as unbelievers has really struck me. So this is important yeah. to remember to pray for within church too, which I've been doing more recently. And it's been important to like reach out to those people and ask if they have any requests. Because others, you're not building those relationships. You're just praying for them and not actually learning about them. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And we're going to spend a week um, in uh, a few weeks looking at specific prayer for others. We're going to actually look at it a little bit more next week, too, because it's something that comes up again and again with Paul. Um, but yeah, that's good. Emily? Um, uh, something what John said um, that it was convicting to me that, you know, he said um, with the youth and being so closely connected to them is it's it's easy for him to be really thankful when he sees progress or like he mentioned with parents it's easy with our own children when we see you know their the growth in their faith um to just be very naturally thankful for that um but then i i i think that that probably shows a disconnect of genuine relationship with believers in the church if it's not our our automatic, you know, an overflow of our hearts um, in thankfulness for the work that Christ is doing in their lives, I, you know, that, that that shows that maybe we're not, um, okay, um, that, that shows that maybe um, we're not as, shh, mommy's talking, I think you know what I'm saying, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes no that's good yeah seeing um uh yeah seeing the growth in others and you know the tendency sometimes in the church can be the opposite that we can tend to be more critical than we are appreciative of seeing the growth of others in christ and so it's sometimes worth worth thinking and reflecting especially if you have somebody in the church who's uh, either a baby Christian or they just haven't grown a lot, but then they start to grow and they're still really rough around the edges. What we can tend to do at times is be more, uh, more bugged by those rough places that we want to see changed. Then we are appreciative of seeing God's grace at work in their life. Um, and that's something that in Paul happens quite a bit too. And first Corinthians one is another place where Paul prays and, and he begins actually the letter talking about how in all of his prayers for the Corinthians, he's thankful for the work of God's grace in their lives, which is crazy because if you read 1 Corinthians, that church had problems, really big problems. Uh, there was a man who was sleeping with his mother-in-law. Uh, I mean, there, there were uh, brothers and sisters in Christ who were suing each other. And yet, even for a church that was really rough around the edges, Paul is still expressing thankfulness for seeing God's grace in their lives because they were still making baby steps toward growth in Christ. They started from a really rough place and any bit of growth he was incredibly appreciative for. And so a lot of times we can learn from that too, is that we would have more of a gracious sensitivity to the work of the spirit in the lives of brothers and sisters so that we would be more appreciative of what God is doing in each other's lives. Yeah, John. Yeah, and, and God tells us to be thankful in all things. And so naturally, like we've been saying, it's, it's always easy to be thankful for the good things that we're blessed with. But then you go further and you need to be thankful for all things. So like the bad things that are happening in your lives that you, that you know of and, um, and not just even the good things that come from the bad things, but that God's plan was to have these bad things and yeah. hardships that are in your life. And that's where it becomes difficult to even think of praying that way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that, um, you know, that's a, uh, we're going to come back to that too, because we're going to have a week where we talk about God's sovereignty in prayer. And that is a really important one. You know, we, we complain about a lot. Um, the weather gets bad. I mean, we're, we're on the upswing now it's in the fifties, you know, but we can, you know, when the weather is bad um, and it's long winter, of course, we escape most of it, so I probably shouldn't talk. But, uh, but still, you know, you go through bad periods of weather and you, we can easily start complaining without realizing that even the snow that comes from the heavens is from God's hand. And he's bringing those things. He's sovereign over those things. And us complaining is a complaint against God, which 
uh, is something that we all need to grow in and recognize. And so we're gonna we're gonna circle around back to that. That's good. That's good. Um, getting into the the last thing, we're at eight o'clock. I don't want to take as much past um, past eight. Um, but we're, we're going to hit on this last one briefly, and this is the third thing that shapes Paul's prayer. And this is an expectation of Christ's return. You see this in a few texts I'm just going to run through. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 11 to 13, Paul says, now may, God our Father, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So he's praying that they would be blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says something similar. Now may God, the God of peace himself, sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Philippians 1, 9 and 10, he says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Uh, and so Paul here is primarily praying that these churches would be ready for Christ's return, that they would grow continually so that when uh, Christ comes back, when the day of Christ comes, whether they die and see him face to face or whether they are alive when Christ comes again, his prayer is that they would be ready and receive even that well done, good and faithful servant enter into the joy of your master. Uh, and so what this means as far as what is shaping Paul's prayer is that he is praying with the second coming of Christ in mind. He's praying with the end in view. That is, hope is not just what's going to happen in this life, but what's shaping him is that Christ is coming again, and he's praying for the church, and obviously his prayers for this, himself would be the same, that he would be ready, that the church would be ready, because ultimately... Our lives are not just about having stuff in this life, laying up treasure where moth and rust uh, destroy and thieves break in and steal, but ultimately we're preparing for an eternity where we're going to be in the presence of Christ, where we're waiting him. And that shapes Paul's prayer at every point. Uh, Carson raises the question uh, in his book saying, can biblical spiritual, uh, spirituality long survive where Christians are not oriented on the world to come. And in this context, can we expect to pray aright unless we are oriented on the world to come? And so I just wanted to end with the last question here. How do we tend to think enough about the coming of Christ, about the world to come, in a way that shapes how we pray, both for ourselves, that we're called to be watchful and waiting, does that shape how we pray for ourselves and as we look forward to seeing Christ? Does that shape how we pray for others? Uh, what do you guys think? Does that f uh, factor in to your prayers much? I would say that I think about it more than I pray about it. Hmm. I guess I never really thought that. I mean, I think that is a great, a great summary, probably of how a lot of us probably think. Um, I would say the same, same exact thing. I think about it, but I don't pray about it much and pray with that in view. Anybody else? The only. Yes, Corey. I think that I pray about that specifically is when I pray the Lord's Prayer. Hmm. Yeah. And, and what specifically about the Lord's Prayer are you thinking of? His kingdom coming? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's another good reason why it's, uh, in addition to praying with Paul, uh, we should receive and meditate on the Lord's Prayer too. Uh, all of these prayers in Scripture are worth thinking about and, and meditating on. Yeah, that's good. Anybody else? Well, that's good. I mean, this is, I do think that Jenny sums up pretty well. Um, 
a lot of how we tend to approach this is we do think about the second coming, but it doesn't always affect our prayers for ourselves and for others. Um, but it should, you know, a, a praying, a praying with eternity val eternity's values in view, praying with the long term, seeing Christ face to face, that should affect the way that we pray. We should pray for our kids that way, that our kids would be prepared to see Christ face to face. Uh, we should pray for us in the church that way. We should pray for others that way. Um, and, you know, there's one in terms of getting how this ought to shape our prayers. There's, uh, uh, I can call him a friend. He's a friend of mine. Um, he, he was eight, in his 80s in a church, two churches back, where we had a leaders meeting. And in this leaders meeting, we were going around giving our testimonies. And um, I don't know how old he was exactly, but um, in his testimony, he had a wonderful testimony, a background in the Mennonite church how he didn't have a real grasp of the Spirit's work in his life, and he came to know the work of the Spirit uh, as he grew older. And he was one of the most humble men I've ever met in my life, a genuine desire to grow. Um, every week, uh, he would write wonderful notes to whoever preached, um, just encouraging them, just a faithful man. But what struck me more than anything was when he was giving this testimony of where he was in his walk with Christ, that he ended by saying that more than anything, as he knows that he doesn't have that many years left in his life, what he wants more than anything is to finish well. Uh, he was praying not just with this life in view, but he's praying with eternity in view. His prayer was that he would end his race well in faithfulness to God. And about three or four years, or actually about a year after that, um, he contracted cancer. And a year after that, he did end up passing away and he did finish well. Uh, his prayer to finish well was answered by God, and God was faithful to him to the end. And the point is, just to emphasize this as we close out, that how we think about God, how we think about uh, others and our thankfulness for them in the church, outside the church, all of those things, and how we think about the end, they shape, they form who we are as people and how we approach God. Uh, and what we need more than anything as we can think about our framework for prayer, what shapes us in prayer, is to be shaped by what God wants us to be shaped with. That we have our eyes upon God, all that he is and all that he has done for us. And our prayer begins there. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I do like the ACTS acronym, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication, and Prayer. Because you begin with your eyes on God. And then that flows into then confessing ways that we have not appreciated all that God is. And then being thankful for all that God is and how he has acted in our lives and then giving supplications, petitions, requests along those lines as well. Um, and so these are ways that we need to be shaped in prayer, that we consistently need to have more of a spirituality in our lives, a spiritual mindedness when we pray for ourselves, when we pray for our friends, when we pray for others in accord with who God is, what he has done for us, being thankful for God's grace in others' lives and looking forward to that day when we and others will see God face to face and praying that we would be ready for that day. Um, and so I've appreciated doing this with you guys, and I hope that in the weeks ahead, we'll continue to grow looking at specific prayers of Paul. And we'll see this framework there, but we're also going to get into the details. What specifically does Paul pray for? And we're going to begin next week in 2 Thessalonians 1, looking at verses 11 and 12, the prayer there. And so if you wanted to look ahead, read it over, get a feel for it, what's going on there, um, that would be a great place to be. It's just two verses, but two verses in Paul um, is like a book for most of us with all that he jam packs in there. So, uh, so anyway, does anybody, as we close out, have any final thoughts? Richard. I think that um, we forget one of the most powerful words that comprise all of our prayers is that final concluding word, amen. Because it is the meaning of which is to say, let it be so according to thy will. And it, all that we have prayed, all that we have asked of God, petitioned of him, uh, the final statement is, Lord, according to thy will, let it be done. And which puts us to a place of being receptive 
to however he is going to deal with us. Yeah. And suffering in our uh, stress, in our joys, in our rejoicing. Um, are we partnering with him as we accept where we need to be in his will? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That is a good word that a lot of our orientation in prayer, a huge part of our orientation in prayer is aligning our desires with God's desires, which is why it's so important to begin with who he is and orienting ourselves on him. And then just like you said, ending with, let it be so. Amen. Uh, wonderful. Any other thoughts? If not, I'm going to ask if anyone wants to close in prayer for us. We've been learning about prayer. We've got to start practicing it. So does anyone want to close? And John's not allowed. <laughs> I'll pray. Great. Thanks, Rich. Yep. Our dear Holy Father, we... We thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. Help us to be hungry to know more about you. Uh, we look at our lives and we don't fall short. We do things we shouldn't do. We stumble, but yet you pick us up and you set us in the right direction again. So thank you for who you are. Thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. We look at our lives and we truly know that you did bless us. So we thank you for Faith Church and we thank you for the pastor and his wife and uh, we just pray lord that uh, faith church will take another step to glorify you we ask this all in thy name amen amen, amen. thank you guys well have a good night thank we'll you. See yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs>